Straight Out of BS podcast. Today I have a special kind of episode for you. Um, I'm going to be interviewing Hannah Kay. Um, she's going to be talking about survivor prom and her experiences in boarding school. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to do a moment of silence for the person still suffering. So on the count of three, I'm going to do a moment of silence. One, two, three. Okay, thank you for that. And also, I would like to congratulate everybody. We have broken 10,000 views. And uh, thank you so much for all of you guys and and gals' continued support um, for this channel. Um, If you want to help support the podcast, links will be down in the description as usual. Uh, Thank you, Janine Miller, Miller for being uh, my part of my Patreon. I really appreciate that. All, all that money goes towards helping better the podcast, making better episodes, improving, getting like a better microphone and stuff like that. Um, so I really appreciate you. Um, and uh, I really appreciate everybody. Let's keep on sharing these videos, get the word out there. And yeah, keep on pushing to 20,000 and then 50,000 and then 100,000 and just keep on going. Let's keep on getting the word out there. Uh, liking the video, sharing it, anything that you can do would help the algorithm. And thank you guys so much. Um, and also, I would like to make a little disclaimer. Please do not do not buy any tickets for the hotel until Hannah provides the link. It will be in the Survivor Prom Facebook group. Um, it's very easily accessible. If you go to Facebook groups and just uh, search for Survivor Prom, it'll be really easy to find. But do not purchase any hotel tickets until she's posted the link so you can get the discount. Otherwise, you would be paying top dollar for the hotel tickets when you could be paying a much lower amount. So with that being said, um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce my guest for the day. So without further ado, let's do this thing. Oops. My name is Hannah Kay, and I went to Lighthouse Christian Academy um, from 2007 to almost the end of 2011. Um, Altogether, it was about four years. Um, I was picked up about a week before my 13th birthday um, by transporters uh, who pulled the old easy way or the hard way and um, took me out of my parents' house and they put me in a vehicle that was cage locked like a police car so it had the full cage bit um took me to the airport i had no idea where i was going i wasn't allowed to talk to my parents about it um and they put me through two flights before i actually arrived um in florida uh from california which is where my parents house was um and finally I got to Florida is kind of when the transporters started acknowledging to me that like I was going to be going to a program and my parents you know were behind this and they asked for this and I was like okay um so I showed up to the program and I went to a religious program uh so you know obviously you know there's all kinds of different programs out there mine was centered around um the bible and god and that was their method for trying to fix us right so um when i got there they took me in and did a you know full body search you know butt naked search Um, They put me in a shower, and after I got into the shower, they actually took the last remaining uh, belongings that I had, which were my clothes, um, and replaced them with some some program clothes that they kind of had in stock, right? Um, And that was basically my first day arriving at that program. When I arrived, I literally thought that it was like an Amish community or something. I don't know. Jordan, did you go to a religious program, or what kind of program did you go to? <clears throat> I went to the other kind of program, like uh, where they do the, the seminars. Okay, cool. So I yeah. Went to so, yeah. Okay, so you went to WASP. Okay. So, um, so yeah, when I pulled up, I literally, you know, there's all these people in like jumpers and giant skirts. You know, I thought it was like Amish or Mennonite. I wasn't like super familiar. I just knew like this was very ultra conservative attire that was very strange to me. Um, so we actually, we went to church three times a day. They used spiritual abuse as a means of forcing us to obey and comply. You know, a lot of the programs even, um, you know, they have more levels uh, or they have um, 
statuses that that children essentially try to rise through in order to uh, graduate the program or prove themselves to their parents or to the staff. Um, and that's not the case that I know of for any religious program, at least for mine, it was completely arbitrary. So you you couldn't say, oh, when I become the highest ranking person here, then I know they'll let me leave. It was simply trying to convince the yeah. staff that you had complied enough or changed enough um, for them to tell your parents, yeah, you can take her home now. Um, so it was very arbitrary. You really didn't didn't know where you stood at any point in time. You just kind of had to try your best to like fake it till you make it, which you know I think is very common in in the industry for for any type of program. Um, so it was very cultic in that you would try to you know get saved to show that you were getting with the program and changing your ways. Um, and then you kind of just go down the rabbit hole of of accepting all these, religious things that you may not necessarily agree with. I, I would say the mass majority of the students were not Christian or um, did not accept that um, denomination of Christianity um, before they got there. But everybody, I would say probably 95% of the students allegedly converted while they were there. Um, it was almost, almost something that they would do within the first week of being there um, to kind of show that they were remorseful and trying to change their ways so they could get out of here as quickly as possible. Uh, because it was obviously, you know, a program that was death by a thousand cuts. You wanted to leave. We uh, we had physical abuse. Um, there was sexual abuse in the program. There was emotional, obviously, and psychological abuse. They used um, methods of seclusion and isolation, of course, including the silence rule, uh, which, you know, kept us from speaking to each other or kept us speaking to from specific people. For at least, I would say, 22 hours a day, if you were in good standing, you could not talk for that long a day. If you were in um, good standing, there might be two hours where you can talk, um, but with a listener, they actually had people come and would monitor our conversations if we were allowed to talk to somebody um, to make sure it wasn't about like movies, which we couldn't talk about, or like any media or anything we ever did before we came to the program or uh, anything like that. You could basically talk about food and um, Jesus and things of that nature. Um, and of course, they also isolated us by uh, means of physical isolation, including like um, an isolation room uh, or an isolation box, you may call it, um, which we called GR, which stood for get right. It was the get right room. Uh, and if you were sent there, it was just like a five by five little box um where people would be put for a minimum of three bit three business days three days <laughs> <laughs> and um in that box you know there was no restroom there obviously wasn't any food anything to do whatsoever it was just a plain box uh that you would sit in and two students would also be forced to sit there and watch you as you sat in the box and if you did anything against the rules of the box like try to sleep lay down um they would actually physically go in there and do something which we called flooring, uh, which was taking the student, the, the peer, their peers would have to do this. So we would have to do this to each other. Um, they would have to tackle them to the ground, put them face down on the ground, and then physically sit on the backs of their bodies. Um, so I had this done to me. I had to do this to other students. And you would be sitting on the backs of their bodies, I would say the minimum for one hour. Uh, and sometimes it went on for hours and hours and yeah. that would result in students being you know complete blood loss uh, circulation loss um by the time we would get off of the backs of these students they could not even pick themselves up off the ground we would actually have to physically massage their arms and legs to kind of restore blood flow so they could pick themselves back up that's how like painful and terrible this was um and this happened for students for for things as little as like picking their fingernails, right? Like this didn't just occur when students were threatening others or threatening to hurt themselves. Like often programs, you know, say that that's when they intervene yeah. in this way. And that's not true. This happened for students picking their fingernails, you know, refusing to read their Bible, refusing to close their eyes during prayer, which is just ridiculous. You know, it's it's incredibly abusive tactic. It blows my mind that anybody would think that this is therapeutic or helping the situation in any way. But um, 
Yeah, so um, other than that, there there was also times when they would have us hold uh, students to their beds physically. Like if they weren't sleeping at night, they may, I, I personally had to hold a student limb by limb to her bed because she wasn't laying down flat in her bed at night. That's it, she just wasn't laying down flat. Um, they well, forced flat us- enough. Flat enough, right? Was she flat enough <laughs> Not, for them? Right? Like, like how I'm sitting right now, if you were sitting this far up in your bed, they would, they would literally be like, no, you can't do that. You have to lay down flat. And mind you, we were not even allowed to lay in our beds during the day. We couldn't even sit on our beds during the day. Um, you know, for four years, I never sat on my bed unless I was sleeping. Um, so yeah, it was just absolute extreme total control um, and, and child abuse. That's what it is in a nutshell. I mean, you know it already. This is just how these programs operate. Our parents paid them uh, or the government paid them thousands of dollars per month to uh, to abuse us into submission. And that's why these programs, you know, don't work long term, in my opinion. Now, of course, I'm not a psychologist, a social worker or any type of professional in the field that can speak to that. But from my own experience, I can say, like, that's why I don't believe that they work. Um, uh, aside How from long were you there? Abusive. Sorry, so, sorry. No, you're good. Um, I was there um, for almost four years. So I, I was sent a little bit before my 13th birthday, like a week before Super oh, wow. And really then um, I got out when I was 17, like a couple months before my 18th birthday. But I had actually been sent twice. And I don't like get into this a lot because it's confusing to people who don't like know that this is a thing. But I was sent there for like two years. I came back for like a couple months and then my parents sent me back a second time. Yeah, I've heard of that happening. Yeah. Yeah. At my program, it was called, um, you were called a be back, meaning that um, when you left, they would say, oh, you'll be back. Is They just thought you were so shitty that you would be back. Excuse my language. Um, and they also had terms like lifer, meaning like you spent pretty much all your teen years there. So like I considered myself a lifer. Everyone like considered me a lifer because I was there for so long. Um, and because it's so arbitrary, you know, I think that's I think that's why people ended up spending so much time there. There were a lot of students who were on scholarship, and that other people were paying for them, and there and that those funds were running out. So they kind of knew that they would be leaving by the time those funds ran out because the program wasn't going to keep like feeding mouths that they weren't getting money for, right? Yeah. But in my case. My parents were definitely paying. My, my parents were donating even further to this program. And so it was funny because I didn't realize this until a couple of years ago. I'm like, no wonder they kept me around for so many years. I'm like, my parents were giving them extra money, sending gifts for all the kids. Like, of course they kept me for that long. They had no reason to. Um, but <clears throat> it all kind of adds up, you know, as we get older. Yeah, what was the average amount of time you'd say that a person was would be at the program that you went to? Um, so I would say that the average and what they advertised was one year. Um, yeah, but, that's what I said too. Yeah, I feel like that's usually kind of what they try to pitch for a lot of these programs. But that's so they, perfect. That's like if you do everything perfect, no yeah, one's in trouble yeah. ever. Like. Yeah, so yeah, if you do everything perfect, like one year is allegedly what it is right but that definitely wasn't the case for me it wasn't the case for pretty much any paying student um I, most students i think were closer to the two year two year mark okay um did um <clears throat> let's see is the program that you went to is it shut down or is it still open do you know my program actually shut down it um it shut down goodness it shut down like two years after I left. So it was, I think 2013 that it shut down. Um, and I, I love shutdown stories because um, they oftentimes show the power of like the survivor community and what it does to a program just by hurting their attendance, which I think was the biggest thing that actually shut my program down. Now, the director of my program or the, the pastor would would probably tell you if you asked that the owner of the property just wanted to sell it right mm -hmm. um, and i believe i believe that you know the owner of the property um was the person who previously owned the program was incredibly abusive um i won't speak to anybody else's experience but if you were to google um michael palmer victory christian academy you will find horrific stories and accusations against him which i think are pretty damning and um confirmed 
Um, but he lived on the property and he, you know, had terrible accusations against him and he was allowed to be around us and he was allowed to eat with us and he was allowed to preach to us. And um, kind of around the time that I left, you know, there was a lot of people snooping around our program, investigators, reporters, people who had gone to my program previously were really shining a light on it in a way that I didn't even know was happening. Um, and uh, we had reporters re reach out at, to the program and, and the program thought they were, you know, one of the good ones. And they were like, sure, come on in. And they actually let reporters come into our facility, take pictures of our isolation boxes and and everything. And um, and when that article came out, it I think it severely hurt the attendance of the program. I think that it um, reopened the the wounds and the spotlight on the previous owner, Michael Palmer, um, and really put the heat on him. Uh, and I think at that point, attendance had hurt so bad and he was so nervous that he was like, I, I, it's time to get out of here. Um, yeah. And I think they probably were having trouble paying the bills, the mortgage for the property as well. So, you know, just sharing our stories, raising awareness can really hurt attendance and that can really shut down programs. Like, like in the realest way, when we get stuff out on Google for parents to find, because parents aren't most of the time trying to put their kids in abusive situations now there are definitely some parents out there that are absolute trash and did you know put their kids and didn't care about their kids didn't do research you know but most of the parents i think are really trying even though they're doing a poor job at it and um and they see that they see this blatant abuse oh this 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 pastor offered these parents five thousand dollars to marry their daughter you know, they're like, well, I do not want to send my kid there. Um, and, and it really does. It hurts the numbers. They can't pay their bills and they have to shut down. Um, so, yeah, that's what happened with my program. Uh, it shut down in 2013. And uh, all the children uh, either went to other homes, um, from what I understand, less, uh, less intense homes. Ours was kind of the most intense one in the area that, like, the other homes would threaten them with. Yeah. Um, but they went to either other homes or some of them, I think, even went home with the staff. Like they went and stayed at the staff's houses and, until, you know, somebody, they either became adults or a family member came to pick them up. But, you know, you've probably seen this or experienced this yourself where a lot of kids just get left there. You know, they're, they're, they're no longer supported by their families and they have nothing. So they, they kind of just go wherever the program puts them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, how's your relationship with your parents? Have you discussed with your parents how it made you feel, like your feelings towards being in the program? And are you, what kind of terms are you on with your parents now? Because I know with mine, I've forgiven my parents, but I'll never forget what they did to me. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so my parents and I have a great relationship. Um, they, they are great parents. I didn't grow up in like an abusive household or anything like that. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, and, uh, they were looking for something that could contain me. You know, there, there are some kids out there who were sent to troubled teen or congregate care settings and they literally like spilt the milk at the dinner table. Like they've, they've never yeah, really parents just didn't want them there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. like the parents just were for some reason sending their kid away and they didn't really have much reason. The kid wasn't necessarily troubled as, as some people call it. Um, I, I was. <laughs> I got into a lot of trouble as a kid. Um, you know, I, I was getting kicked out of school. I was skipping school. I was running away. You know, I did have at-risk youth behavior. Um, that's not to say it was okay to send me there or that that was ever going to be a help to me. Um, but that is the reality of kind of what our situation was. So my parents were looking for um, something to kind of contain my behavior and, and ultimately keep me safe, right? Um, and they definitely um, have regrets, you know, they, they were very sad to hear kind of, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago now that I really opened up to them about what happened to me and how my program operated. And I think it just, that just took so much time because I, I had always assumed that they knew. Um, and my parents are, are very conservative, you know, we don't share a lot of the same political beliefs or, or perspectives. Um, so I kind of just always thought, oh, they're just, they're tough love people. They kind of knew what was going on, but it turned out they didn't. They really had no idea how I was being treated, how other students were being treated. 
you know, they were directly lied to um, in a lot of ways, including the, the contract that they were given that outlined um, how they dealt with, with student discipline. Um, uh, and yeah, so, so once I kind of opened up to them about that and hashed it out with them, you know, they were very remorseful for sending me there. And, um, you know, I, I know it breaks their heart on, on a, a level that's that's close to mine. So um, that really paved the way for healing there and, and a repair of our relationship. And, and they fully support my advocacy work. Now, they're still my parents. They're not perfect. Um, but they support me as their daughter. They support my work and, and you know, support children's rights and, and protections moving forward for sure. Okay. Um, if you could go back in a time machine and not go through that program, would you do it and why? Knowing what you know now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, going to a troubled teen program, um, out of everything I've gone through in my life, is the most traumatizing thing. And, and I don't say that lightly. I've been through a lot in my life, even before the program and after the program. Um, but the program, by far, has been the most detrimental to po both my development um, as well as my mental health. Um, you know, prior to the program, I I suffered a little bit from depression, and, and sometimes I like to label that, like, just teen angst. I feel like all teenagers get depressed, you know, as they go through school and have their little dramas and whatever. Well, it's um, part of puberty, I feel like. Sure, you yeah, know? you know, like, that's that's what's funny, is people say these kids are troubled, and, and a lot of it is just regular teen behavior, right? Um, so, so prior to the program, I did experience, like, some depression. Um, but I, I had never had anxiety in my life. I had never had panic in my life. I never had any hypervigilance or symptoms of PTSD or complex post-traumatic stress um, until after my program. And when I got out of my program, I suffered um, almost immediately and, and deeply from panic and anxiety. I, I simply was not prepared um, to be an adult and to be uh, functional and self-serving. It, it was just nothing I was familiar with from the last four years of my life. Um, so I, I really struggled to be out in the world and um, kind of figuring out who I was outside of the program. And um, it, it's never really gone away. I still suffer from, from anxiety. I still have panic disorder, um, hypervigilance. I'm, you know, I struggle with all of those things every day. Um, and, and I like to think that it's slowly getting better with the help of medication and therapy, uh, but the reality is I would not have those things if, had I not gone to the program. So I absolutely, if given the chance, time machine, back it all up, like skip over that entire part, have a normal childhood, uh, have a normal experience because we miss so much uh, by going to the troubled teen industry um, and not having a normal high school experience. You know, we learn so much more than I think people will acknowledge in that setting. Um, so absolutely, I'd go back cancel it all out okay <clears throat> um how did you get in let's go into how how you got involved in advocate advocacy and like um or, well first of all let's go a little bit into like what happened after you got out like um did you um like like for me for example i got heavy into hard drugs when i got out sure. um dealing or not dealing whatever you want to call it with what happened to me there um, so, like, did you have, like, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but did you have, like, a really low period after you got out, or, and how, how did you get involved in advocacy? How did that play into? Yeah. So, um, when I got out of my program, I was thoroughly brainwashed. You know, I had been there for four years. Excuse me. Um, it was a religious program that I had to fake till I made, and much like you fake till you make, um, you fake a religion long enough, and you kind of start to believe it, and I was fully brainwashed um, into their doctrine. I was so brainwashed, in fact, that I cried a lot before I left. I was absolutely convinced that the world would kill me. You know, when I got out, I remember crying to the staff about it. Um, I was so scared to leave. And um, the only piece that I found was um, saying, okay, what if I go to, you know, this religious college that, um, that they had recommended for me that they said oh if you go here you know they'll keep you on the straight and narrow you'll be safe and i was like okay so i actually left that program and immediately went to a christian college that they were pushing towards us 
um, which was called Hiles Anderson College, and it's virtually the the boot camp of Baptist colleges. It's it's just the strictest, most ridiculous place you'll ever go to if you were, go to. Were, was it connected to the school you went to at all? It was, was not. It? it was not connected. However, the staff from my school, some of them had attended there, and um, you know they they um, the independent fundamental Baptist kind of movement, which is what Hiles Anderson was, as well as my program. It's it's very unique, very close. A lot of the religious programs, even even though they're not owned by the same people, they know each other. So, yeah. like my my program knew the owners of Agape, and like we would send encouragement cards to the boys there. Now they could never write back to us. We never like got to communicate with them, but they allowed us to like write write write, write Bible verses on these cards and send them to the boys. So, um, yeah. So so the it's a very small world and. Um, so they recommended that I go to that college, and I went there, um, and that was basically when the anxiety started, the panic, and I was hospitalized three times, I think, inside of a couple of months. Um, with, Did it like, feel like you were back there? Like, do you, do you know what it was about being there that? No, I don't think it was from being there. Honestly, I think it. I think it was actually the little bit of freedom that I had suddenly. Um, I think it was. It was something that just made me sick to my stomach and terrified. Um, like you were doing something wrong, maybe? Yeah, you know, like, yeah. yeah, like, um, for some reason, you know, when when you take a religious program and you take these million rules, like, like you can't say the word cool or, like, I couldn't say cool or pants. I couldn't acknowledge TV or movies or media at all. And so, like, even being at a, at a Christian college that was very strict, it was nowhere near as strict as my program. Um, so like having a laptop and having all these things, it, it was very overwhelming for me. And I, and it was and I it was like I had gone in at 12 years old and I came out an 18 year old woman and mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know how to function. I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing all day or how much I should care about, you know, whatever. And and it it, it was like I was in the setting where I should continue playing a game where I believe this religion. But I was also in the world and I was like, the religion was starting to kind of fall off of me. I realized there wasn't any consequences if I don't believe this anymore. And um, and so it was all just very chaotic internally for me. And I, and it, I started experiencing a lot of physical symptoms that I think went along with my anxiety. I won't get into the details, but it's gross. And I was hospitalized three times. They could not, I mean, I was having tons of physiological symptoms. My white blood cell count was through the roof in so much that they thought maybe I had some kind of infectious disease like spinal meningitis. I had a spine tap. They put me in isolation and like had all these like suited up doctors coming to see me and to try to figure out what was wrong with me. And um, ultimately they never pinpointed anything. And I realized like this is just a result of physiological symptoms from my PTSD, my anxiety, um, that's come as a result of my program. So that was kind of my first steps outside of the program was that, and I was so sick that I, I had to quit the college and go back home to California, um, where my parents promptly um, kicked me out for my behavior and kind of the stuff that I was getting into when I got back. Um, so I was pretty much homeless within six months of leaving the program. Um, did, you, did you start experimenting? I mean, you don't have to go into it if you don't want to, but did, like, were you experimenting with drugs or just like risky yeah. behavior? Like, okay. Yeah, risky behavior. Yeah, I, I, I was using drugs really quickly again. I was... Um, just like avoidance uh, type things? Yeah, kind, yeah, kind of. all that stuff. So I, um, so I, you know, I fell right back into some really bad habits, if not worse habits that I had prior to the program. And um, my parents kicked me out. I was homeless and I was homeless in California after being gone for years. So I really didn't have friends anymore. You know, your friends, they grow up without you and they move on. And I didn't really have anybody, but I managed to make some friends somehow and got a couch to sleep on and um, kind of did chores around the house to, to help out until I was able to, to get a driver's license because I didn't even have an ID at this point. I just had yeah, trash. I didn't get mine until 21. Yeah, I didn't even have an ID. I didn't have a driver's license. I didn't have an ID. I didn't have a phone. I I just had nothing, and um, I really had to like put put my head down and try to figure out how I was going to get on my feet. And and you know, I'm I'm privileged in a lot of ways um, that helped me get on my feet, and, and I'm grateful for those things. I know that I'm one of the lucky privileged ones, and I know that so many survivors um, in the same situation are still struggling today. Um, so for that, I'm really grateful. 
Um, but I managed to get on my feet and, and keep moving. And, and today, you know, I own a couple businesses, which is amazing. Um, I have the opportunity to be more involved in advocacy work. I started that um, maybe like three years ago now, I would say. I think late 2019, early 2020, somewhere in there. Um, and uh, I started actually on TikTok. I had seen a couple of people, um, a man, a householder comes to mind, uh, uh, and uh, and I thought, oh, I'm like, I went to a program like that. I bet you I could talk about that and people might care. And, um, you know, I started sharing my story on there and it kind of blew up, like at least it blew up for me. I had never expected anybody to care about my story or care about the troubled teen industry. Um, and I wasn't aware that there was an entire community of people who kind of recognized and acknowledged this issue. So I, I was just talking to the void at that point. I didn't know who would listen. And I, I pulled together a good 65,000 followers on TikTok and people were hearing my story and learning about the industry. And I thoroughly enjoyed kind of not just sharing my story, but educating people about like how these programs operate and, and just how how incredibly controlling and manipulative they are. Um, because those are the details that I think get lost sometimes in like the big abuse stories. Um, and so I started there on TikTok and then I, I kind of found our community online. I found Breaking Code Silence. Um, I worked with them for a little bit on their social media team. Um, and then when they incorporated formally, I, I worked there again, uh, mostly on social media still, but also showing up at events, protests, things like that, helping coordinate a few things there. Um, and then I started volunteering uh, with Unsilence just recently. Um, I don't know when I signed up for that, maybe six months ago now. And um, and yeah, so I, I try to help them out as much as I can. I'm a little more hands off than I used to be because um, I am working on Survivor Prom, and that's kind of taken up all my time these days. But um, yeah, it's been a it's been a crazy three years. I love uh, I love being a part of this community, and I love the chance to to kind of educate people about this problem. So I'm really grateful. Okay, <clears throat> awesome. <clears throat> well, let's get into Survivor Prom then. Um, <clears throat> Go ahead and like um, just talk about like how you came up with the idea, um, what what Survivor Prom is. Um, pretty much an update is like where we are now with Survivor yeah. Prom, how people can get involved, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. So um, so Survivor Prom. Um, you know, this is something that's really I can't say that it's my idea because people have talked about doing something like this probably for decades, but at least I know since I've been on the scene, people have always talked about this. Um, prom is just one of those experiences that as survivors of the troubled teen industry or, or survivors of cults or congregate care settings, you know, a lot of us either miss that event entirely, excuse me, or a lot of people had like a very half-ass weird prom that their program maybe tried to put on for them. Um, but it was never like that teenage dream, you know, it was never that like, I'm going to get together with all my friends and we're going to get dressed together and we're going to take pictures and we'll take the limo to school and like maybe there will be some drama but maybe I'll kiss a guy or like nothing fun like that you know it was always either not at all or some pretend prom that they they pretended to give us um for me I didn't have prom at all so that was a big miss out for me um I think it's funny when I talk to people about it today I think they think it's very silly or like it's not a big deal um, but for those of us who missed out on it, it really does feel like a big deal because as a child, that was like the quintessential moment of your high school career. It was like it all happens with prom and maybe your sweet 16 and then graduation. And most of us missed, you know, all of those things, if not at least a couple. Mm -hmm. um, so Survivor Prom was just the fun one that I thought, you know, that would be really cool to kind of bring everybody together, experience this, take it back, you know, make this our own. Not about, not a night about trauma. I don't really want it to, to be something where we're all getting up and talking about our trauma. Like that, save that for another day. Let's just like celebrate us and our community. Um, our community is 1000% what makes the fight happen, right? Like nobody cares other than our community. Um, and, and a lot of people don't even know about it. And so without a community that's, really brought together, that's really unified, um, the fight doesn't happen. And so I thought this event would be a great way to give survivors back that moment and also kind of unify our community a little bit. You know, everyone is invited to prom if you're a survivor. Um, it's got nothing to do with me. It's, it's got everything to do with our teenage selves and what they deserve, right? Um, so that's kind of the idea. 
Um, it's very, you know, typical prom. It, it's not going to be anything like extra special, except that there is going to be a cash bar. <laughs> um, that's pretty much the only difference. It's going to have, you know, photos. It's going to have music. It's going to have photo ops. Uh, we're going to have dinner. Uh, and we're all just going to kind of connect and dance and party together. So it's going to be super cool. Um, the event is going to be in L.A. Uh, on October 21st of this year. And um, right now we're in like the fundraising round. So we're raising funds uh, to help bring down the ticket cost for the event. Um, so because we have a dinner, that's kind of our biggest variable cost, and that's kind of what the tickets are going to cover, um, or that's what we're hoping they'll just cover. Uh, the fundraiser is to help us bring down that cost by helping us pay for, uh, of course, the venue, tables and chairs, um, the dance floor, the DJ, security, insurance, taxes and gratuities, the food and beverage, obviously. Um, so there's a lot of expenses that go into prom. Um, and so that's kind of what the fundraiser is for. It's to help us bring down those expenses so that we don't have to pass uh, as much of it on to the actual ticket buyers or the attendees. Um, we also have a uh, discounted hotel block um, because the event is being held at the hotel and we would love for people to not um, party and drive. Uh, we are having a block of rooms at the hotel which are discounted for our event specifically. And people, after they buy tickets, will be able to get a link to book their very own discounted hotel room at the same hotel. Um, so that's super cool. That makes it much easier for people who are traveling. Um, also, because we have a free shuttle that's going to go from the LAX airport to the hotel. Comes every 30 minutes. And that's free. So we're just trying to make it as affordable and um attainable as possible you know for as many survivors as we can and any money that we raise over our goal uh, is going to be directly used uh, for survivors to attend so we'll we'll be applying it to various people trying to help them out with with tickets or hotel rooms maybe even flights but that's all dependent kind of on how the fundraiser goes but every dollar of this will go into the event or to the survivors attending it's it's uh, not, none of it's coming to me or to the, any other organizers. So yeah, I, I <clears throat> I'm a little nosy, and I I've read a few comments of people worried about where the money is going. So that was actually going to be one of the questions that I was going to ask. Is like where you know because I know it's online and all that, but people are yeah still yeah. I mean, we posted that, content so. on you know the Facebook group, the Instagram. You know, we kind of posted slides that say you know where's the money going or what's the money being used for. Um, Sometimes people don't see it, but it's on there. If you check any of the social channels, uh, you can find that. And if anybody has any questions, they're always welcome to either hit me up via DMs or, or email me. You can reach me at uh, survivorprom at gmail.com. Okay, cool. And I'll uh, pin the links in the description of this video too. Cool. So when it's posted, Love it. we'll have a little, all the links and whatnot. Love um, it. I did have um, a few questions. Oh, so the discounted rate. So like <clears throat> for me, I'm probably going to want to spend like several days in L.A. because I one, I've never been to L.A. So like for people like that, is it going to be a discounted rate just for that first night or are we going to like if we wanted to get more nights, would it be a discounted rate for all the nights or do you, do you know? So I, I actually got us approved for you will still get that discounted rate if you book a night before and a night after. So for that whole weekend, you will get the discounted rate if you want it. Um, okay. Yeah, so you'll you'll get it for that whole weekend. I don't think it extends past that weekend, um, but Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you should get it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and do we know what hotel it's going to be for sure? Yeah. Um, so I do know what hotel it's at. I just the only reason I wouldn't share it is because I don't want people to book it without the link because then they won't get the discount. Yeah. Um, so if you wouldn't, we can just cut that one out if you don't mind. Okay, that's fine. Because I just don't want to confuse anybody or make them pay more than they have to right now. Yeah, yeah. If I say it, I said it before and people went and started booking and I was like, no, you don't have the discount yet. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I'll put a reminder in the description too of the okay. video. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, once people buy their tickets, the, the hotel link is going to be sent to them directly, so. Okay, cool. Yeah. But just yeah. so you know, it's at the Hilton LAX airport. Okay, <laughs> okay, cool. <clears throat> and so and the main event is just going to be the one night thing right with the with the dinner and then the dance yeah. and all that and then everybody if you want to stay longer it'll be your own kind of thing yeah so um right now the only thing that it is is just the one night event um however depending on the fundraiser and kind of how things roll out 
we may be adding some other special surprises to uh, to the the menu. <laughs> What's the word I'm thinking of? The the to do list. <laughs> timeline, you know, yeah. I can't think of the word right now. Um, we might be adding some stuff to to the day, uh, maybe before, maybe after. I don't know. Um, it, it kind of all has to do with like some insurance stuff and and some other things. But um, there may be some surprises, and if so, um, they will definitely be posted up on both the social channels and sent out via email. We do have a subscriber list now, um, so if anybody is concerned about missing any of the important updates, they can subscribe uh, at our link tree, which you can find on Instagram uh, or Facebook. Okay, cool. And um, let's see. Oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I make music, and I know a couple other people that had had said something about this. Um, where would I go to like um, maybe potentially play some of my music or whatnot? Like, how would we arrange that? Um, you know, that's something for you and me. Let's talk about it. Um, you know, we can uh, we can talk about what that looks like. I have a couple DJs right now, so I'm not sure what kind of music you play. But um, if it's as simple as like just getting the DJs your music to play, I mean like, hey, this is from Survivor Jordan, you know, I don't know your last name. Um, you know, this is his stuff. Like, hopefully you'll be there at the event. Uh, yeah, you know, here, here, yeah, here he is and here's his music. And like, that would be, that would be super cool. I would love to play Survivor stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm probably gonna send you some music that way. And then I'm also thinking about maybe doing some collaboration work with some, some DJs. I would love something like that. I would love to do like a Survivor place. Cause one of the things that's so difficult about music is, um, you know, making sure that all the music we play is not um, triggering, you know? Um, so it's kind of been a challenge to kind of go through and, and hope that we haven't selected any songs that were used to abuse yeah. children um, or adults. Uh, so, so survivor mixes, you know, those are pretty much always in the safe zone. So I love that. I would love to definitely talk to you and learn more. Okay, cool. For sure. For sure. We will do that. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, <clears throat> just a random question. Do you know if service animals are going to be allowed at the prom? Yes. I assume so. Uh, I assume so. Cause it's a hotel. Probably. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, not only is it a hotel, it's a Hilton hotel. So yeah. not only not only are they service animal friendly, um, they're also just pet friendly. So you can actually do both. If you have service animal or pet, um, they're both welcome at the Hilton hotels. Okay, cool. And then there will be a bar, but there's not going to be drinks served, right? I don't drink, yes. so it doesn't matter. Yes, so drinks are not being served at this event. Uh, however, they do have bar carts that they will have. And if you would like to be drinking, you will, on your own volition, go up to the carts and order your own drinks. But alcohol is not being served at the tables. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, I don't really have any more questions for okay. you as of right now. Well, I appreciate uh, it. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, we will be in touch. I also want to get a, a fundraising link or whatever because I want to fundraise some money. So. Oh yeah, let me send you that. I'll send you that and then send me your music as well. And then we'll, we'll I would love to hear also who else you're thinking about collaborating with because I think that's a really fun thing, okay? Yep, yep, for sure, for sure. All right, Perfect. thank you. Have a good Thanks day. Thanks for you All too. Right, bye.